All right. Testing, testing. Are we live? Are we live? Is, is, is this send a redirect? Uh, I hope so. Is it going to send a redirect? I hope so. I, I don't know. I just said start a new live, so that okay. was probably going to be going over. <sighs> Stupid idiot. Kick me for that one. All right. Um, oh, well, actually, we do have people showing up, it looks like. Thank goodness. Go. Yep. Okay. Ugh. Idiot. All right. Well, thank you once again, everybody, for for your patience with this. What? Will your mic stand? It's a little late now, unfortunately. Oh, but... yeah, because you can't do it. Right. 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 All right. Last. Boy, after all that. Hi there. Okay, at last. I'm very sorry for, for that. And that one was, of course, my own stupid fault. I was trying to adjust the mic so that the cable would not show uh, in the picture. And I ended up literally unplugging the mic and pulling it out. And I could not find a way to uh, get the sound back. I, obviously, I reconnected the mic. That didn't matter at all. Yeah, chaos ensues, indeed. I know, but I just don't like it at the expense of, uh, well, the fine folks watching here. However, look, welcome back, everybody. As usual, we've had a little fun adventure here, but hey, nonetheless, at least we can finally get down to doing what I promised that we would do. And that is we are going to try cooking an omelet, maybe even four omelets, on um, just the residual heat of a cast iron pan to see how well they do. So without further ado, since you folks have waited long enough already, let's get a couple of eggs out to be ready for it. One, two, three, as well as butter. And once the butter is ready, then we will be ready. Uh-huh. And now, finally, yeah, just watch. I'm going to drop. <laughs> you know what I was saying? Yeah, watch. I'm going to drop the eggs. <laughs> Don't even joke about that at this point. Okay. Now, at last. First up, ugh, the heaviest pan here, which would be the uh, Finex cast iron skillet. So, oh, always something. Come on, can't even get the butter out. Ugh, there. All right, well, let, despite the little mishaps here, aren't there always, this uh, is not, uh, this is turning out to be actually a little easier than I expected at this point. Let's just simply do this. Use a uh, spatula here. And having done that, uh, <clears throat> Finally, let's, oh, well, at least we get something, don't I? Mainly a bowl to crack the eggs. There we go. Since my time is limited, let's get these things going ASAP. One. Ah. Wait a second. Didn't I say omelets? Oh, well. Two. Looks like... Got a bit of a, um, looks like this thing here is kind of like giving us its own ideas because it seems like whenever I panic, I tend to uh, do uh, stupid things and not re remember what I'm doing. I said I was going to do an omelet. <laughs> oh, well, well, what can we do? I guess the show must go on. Let's, uh, rather than uh, doing an omelet, Let's uh, see how well we can now uh, cook these eggs here. And that part is easy enough. Now, this pan had been heated to about... Well, there is that. It's going to be a steak and eggs. Um, it, this pan had been heated to about 350 degrees. And yet, even so, um, well, it does look like it is kind of congealing here. I will say that much. Nonetheless... And remember, again, this is a thick and heavy Finex cast iron skillet. This should not have uh, 
you know, lost too much heat. Uh, the eggs I, uh, probably were not room temperature. That may very well have had an effect on it. But even so, I'd say these things are uh, probably, they may be cooling off a little faster than I had hoped here. Currently, we are already down to 141 degrees here. So it's like this little experiment is questionable because after only a couple of minutes or so, it looks like this is uh, already chilled down to about, you know, less than 150 degrees. That didn't take very long either. And this was a thick and heavy cast iron skillet. So I know these things are supposed to uh, retain heat. Well, this thing uh, does look like it has uh, cooled off pretty quickly. So the first, I guess you could say the first test here has not been as successful as I would have liked. Because if this is supposed to be a uh, modern day cast iron skillet designed to retain heat, well, it's really questionable about uh, whether or not it's going, whether or not the other three pans are going to uh, work successfully here. So <laughs> pans should be good and hot. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I have a butter dish like yours. Well, I'm glad you like that. It's all good. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Um, okay. But, well, obviously, we can't uh, just give up. I mean, that show must go on. Anyway, the whole point of this was, as I said, to test heat retention. I was kind of hoping that this would have uh, done a little better than this. And actually, yeah, if I was going to do an omelet, I'm, it's actually questionable as to whether or not that would have been a success either. So that's okay. Um, one thing at least I can say nonetheless, as I mentioned already, you know, this Finex pan here, um, let me see, this part here is, uh, you know, the uh, handle here is allowing me to grip it. The... Uh, the end of the handle here, it's, well, let me actually check because this end of the handle here has uh, even cooled down at this point. And this is the part that's supposed to be able to, uh, you know, conduct the heat from here to here. So this thing is actually cooling off pretty rapidly. In a way, I guess that's a lesson learned. What it really means is that, no, I'm not going to be able to uh, cook an um, to um, cook an omelet on the residual heat. That's definite. So I can say I've learned something. Well, then how about this? Let's not waste any more time. Um, I do have plenty of eggs, and I was not. I'm not. And I'm not really worried about uh, about wasting these. Rather, let's get let's go back and uh, get do something a little bit more exciting here. So we will just put these aside for the time being. Thank you. Thank you so far for what has been a really <laughs> wonderful evening so far. Between the mishap, oh, that was actually mishap number two, it seems like. Oh, so far, we're off to a great start, aren't we? Between the feed locking up, between the uh, experiment, not, uh, yeah, kind of uh, petering out at the beginning. Having done that, I'd say at the point, I think I should probably try to make up for it and make something a little bit more interesting. In that, we've got, where the heck did that thermometer go? There we are. Okay. This one, this uh, pan here, meanwhile, is uh, still heated up to a nice temperature, as is the uh, Erie and the, and the Black Lock. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to have to say the residual heat test is likely going to have to be to be continued. But meanwhile, now that this thing here is back up on heat, uh, well, it is slowly uh, heating up. And I guess that's one thing about a thick and heavy cast iron pan. It does take a long time to heat up as well, even though it did not seem to take as long to cool down as I thought. But since we are here, how about we do a little bit more cooking the way we're supposed to have something that looks a little bit more enjoyable and talk a little bit about cast iron, which is really the whole, which is really the reason why folks come here to these chats. And I do appreciate that. But um, because there is still, there are still a lot of things to say as well um, about, um, you know, thick versus thin cast iron. And there's no question about that. Um, 
namely that, as I said, you know, you've got the heat retention for one, um, which really does mean that um, that's the main reason why people uh, use cast iron in particular for making uh, certain uh, dishes, such as uh, omelets or egg or uh, scrambled eggs, or especially for steaks. My original plan for this was, in fact, this is still no good. My original plan, in fact, for this was to have, have a cook-off, and then the winner of this would uh, is going to uh, cook two steaks, which I do actually have sitting right here on the counter anyway. So, <laughs> all right. Nonetheless, it's, it's, okay. since we're here, um, I'm actually going to turn the temperature up a little bit on this end. And let's have some, let's have some fun here, if you don't mind. So, I mean, let's let's try doing something a little bit more enjoyable, and cook the way we are supposed to cook. Because that's one thing I've uh, you know my channel here has always been as as I mentioned, especially for the cooking. As I as I've said, I mean I do appreciate very much that uh, a number of cast iron channels that have um, that have really taken off here as far and yeah you know, with all the advice about collecting and restoring uh, vintage cast iron because you know there's never any end to that. I've been still doing my best here trying to. Uh, Make, uh, make this channel even more about cooking in in cast iron rather than uh, yeah, I mean as much as uh, you know, restoring antique cast iron is is well just that it's uh, really the reason why my collection is the way it is. Um, really, the whole point has been to uh, make these pans into users even more. Yeah, make these pans into users even more than just uh, just simply uh, collectors. And I really hope that that's the case actually for a lot of people because these aren't just uh, vintage pans here. I'm putting a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of water in there to loosen that up. These aren't just uh, vintage pans, of course. You know, they are still great kitchen users and that's really why they are so sentimental. There we go. Now that's what I had wanted to do. Ugh. Okay, the mishaps are over as far as I'm concerned here. What we're using right now, again, is a uh, nice, uh, is the uh, Red Mountain series uh, cast iron skillet and number eight. At this point, I do have the stove top on uh, just under medium heat, and this is actually doing what I had hoped would happen with the uh, Finex skillet. As you can see, it's... Um, yeah, the other thing is that I've got myself a crappy stove. There's no denying that. That's why a part of this does seem to uh, cook uh, faster than the other. The heating is unfortunately not even, so I have to uh, turn it around. And it's only been in there for uh, less than a minute as well. So hmm. while we're doing this, did you make me switch, Bill? Um, okay, I got to pronounce your name right, Bill. Uh, Le Bleu, I believe you said it was. Yeah, I, you told me that yourself. So, yeah, I left on the link. And meanwhile, uh, we've got here Kevin Mass saying, I have the same pan in the lie tank, which we can't wait to try. Which one is that? Would that be a Fine X in the lie tank or, or a BSR? <laughs> uh, Raymond, I missed the lockup. Greetings to all. Well, yeah, you missed, uh, you missed a little bit more than the lockup as well, too, unfortunately. My experiment kind of... Uh, Crashed and burned right out of right out of the uh, right out of the starting gate, unfortunately. But that's all right. We are uh, still getting by here. Uh, I figured we'd make up for it just by simply cooking ourselves a nice omelet here, or three, because I want I want to make an example of each one here. Um, I can always bring the uh, fine X back, or we can uh, work on one of the other uh, two uh, unused pans. But meanwhile, as you can see, though, the eggs are uh, congealing uh, pretty quickly. It's already at the point where we just need to uh, lay, lay ourselves down rogue cheese. And actually, that's one, one thing I'm really grateful about having learned how to cook. Namely, that be, it makes it so easy to uh, just simply uh, cook up an omelet like this when you feel like you're, uh, when you feel like you're hungry. <laughs> 
Okay, got to do this in a manner that won't break it. So, and of course I broke it. There we go again with my omelet skills or lack thereof. So from here, let's just move this around a little bit. There, hey, that part worked. That did not take long at all. Looks like the end here, in my bad, again, is a little bit less done than the other. So I guess we will just have to turn that around. And we're not doing too badly now. So very much appreciate everybody's uh, patience here. As I mentioned, um, you know, this pan here, this is this is the uh, BSR number uh, number eight Red Mountain, which is one, one of my all-time favorite kitchen users. As you can see, um, despite the mishaps tonight, we're not having any trouble at all with this one. And this um, semi-omelet is uh, not sticking at all, is it? So let's just try to see what we can do to flip this. Actually, what I should do is quickly dig myself out. Here we go. This is what I should have been using in the first place. Come on. Do this right, why don't you? Ugh. There, that's better. Well, that worked at least. In spite of everything, we actually managed to uh, make, an, make an omelet. As they say, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. <laughs> so far, I've, uh, my track record is 0 and 1, or maybe even 0 and 1 half. Here's one thing up about uh, being able to lift a cast iron pan, heavy versus light, and that is when you want to uh, lift it up, give it a tap and flip it over onto the plate. <laughs> So that at least is uh, one semi-successful omelet. Um, I have always attempted to uh, fold my omelet uh, double, uh, more like a French style, even though I am nowhere near, I have nowhere near the skill to be able to make one of those beautiful uh, French omelets. Nonetheless, I don't think there's anything to complain about this one. So we're, that takes care of that. At this point, let's just shuffle these things around a little bit. Probably the easiest way to do that would be bring this over here. And that comes here. All right. Next up here for, for display. Uh, this is another modern-day cast iron skillet, and it's... Uh, and it's one that, uh, well, I guess you could say there is a little bit, bit of controversy about it. Namely, it is the uh, Lodge 10-inch Blacklock skillet, which they only started producing about two to three years ago. Um, now, I think it was only two years ago, in fact. Now, the reason why it's what the controversy is, the controversy is among the cast iron cooking crowd, not so much among the just regular users, because... Uh, Lodge obviously produced this pan, especially to compete with other modern-day USA cast iron makers, such as Finex, whom they now own, or or Field, or Stargazer, or all the or all the like. And so they designed themselves a nice, thin, light pan, one which has a price that uh, kind of approaches those of the uh, of, of the modern-day USA makers as well. But of course, because it's coming from a Lodge. People only say one thing. How come you don't grind down the uh, surface of this? Uh, why can't you, you know, why can't you polish it smooth the way the other, the way the other makers do it? And that happens every time uh, we talk about, a, uh, about the uh, Lodge um, Black Lock here. The thing is, is that you really, I am very much of the uh, opinion that you do, that Lodge, well, it's not even an opinion. Lodge designed this particular cooking surface for a reason. They did so especially so that seasoning will adhere properly to the pan. And, that, and because of that, no, they do not polish their, smooth, their skillets down to a glass smooth surface. Yet 
they do actually uh, smooth the surface down. I've gone over that in a couple of uh, prior videos as well. And so, be and what's more important is that it's really not necessary to have a glass smooth surface to uh, cook something like an egg, for instance. All right, let's not make that mistake again. And let's get these things. Actually, let's move this over slightly here. There we go. That way we will have more of a view here. Uh, by the way, we've got Abtruse Moose saying, it would make sense to me to have smooth ones available for the people who would buy them, customer demand. Well, and I can understand where you're coming from, but I think a kind of lodge is actually in uh, something of a bind right now for a couple reasons. First of all, it's because they began producing uh, their do this right, began producing their pre-season pans that the company actually came roaring back. You know, they were on the verge of bankruptcy in the 1990s or so. Um, and But when they hit upon pre-season skillets of the kind where you could just literally take it home and start cooking with it, uh, then that actually saved the company. And that is the main reason why they use that process on all of their pans. On the other hand, the environment certainly has changed from, say, 20 to 30 years ago. And I do know that there are a lot of people uh, clamoring for Rao uh, Lodge to make some polished smooth skillets. So my concern is this. I mean, again, I don't work for Lodge. I am not privy to any anyone at Lodge, so I have no... Uh, inside uh, knowledge of the company at all. But suppose this, what would happen if Lodge produced a uh, glass smooth pan? What about all of the other pans they're producing at, uh, you know, for that are cheap enough to, uh, to uh, be uh, sold at Walmart and the like? Would they have to stop making those? Would they have to only make expensive high price cast iron pans? I mean, because they would obviously have to rebuild um, part of their uh, line, especially to, to uh, produce these uh, glass smooth pans. And uh, that would very well have an effect on their business. I mean, there's almost, uh, it's almost certain uh, to be the case there. Now, I'm only bringing this up, I think, really as a, just uh, to uh, play, to play, you know, to uh, make a point and to, uh, I guess, like play devil's advocate here. Because, as I said, I don't work for Lodge. I do not have um, any inside information. And I'm not saying this just simply to defend Lodge pans. I don't think they need to be defended. Because I love Lodge pans. I love cooking in Lodge pans. This Blacklock skillet here. Um, I've used this many, quite a few times now. No, you don't. Quite a few times as a chef skillet. Uh, because it does have a nice rounded edge to it. And um, that means this makes it, you know, really useful for making uh, things, especially like, say, omelets here, for what? Let's turn this around again. And see how well it works this time. Um, JD High 4, they'd sell that line at a premium, and it would justify itself. Uh, Lodge and BSR Thick. Griswold and Wagner and any that came before that thin. Uh, I guess Lodge does make a smooth pan if they own if they own Finex. Well, yes, uh, Finex um, Lodge actually bought them out. So I mean, for business reasons, I, I as I said, I'm not privy to Lodge, and I don't have any details about uh, their about the reason why they uh, bought out Finex. Um, is it to acquire their, uh, you know, their patterns to do smooth pans? I don't know. That didn't, and this certainly did not take long at all, though. I mean, if anything, it's only been like maybe a few seconds or so. So let's get that cheese on here quickly and uh, try ourselves another omelet. See if this one works out any better than the last one. Besides, the first one, just like when making pancakes, the first one, is usually the hardest one to make because then, you know, got to get more used to it. So, turn this around here. And, let me 
Okay, this may not be done quite yet, or maybe it is. All right. Let's see if we can do this right, shall we? Let's see if we can get this in. And I don't want to break the end again. Actually, this one's turning out not bad here. There we go. We're off to a start here. Aha. Uh -huh. This one actually seems to be holding together nicely. There we go. This one is an improvement over the last one. No question about that. So now this would be omelet number two. This one was made in a modern day pin lodge, uh, black lock here. Papa Dan, William Hurt put Martin into the thick category, and I agree with you. Oh, yeah I, yeah, I agree there, actually. Several years ago, I came across a Martin number eight, and that is definitely thicker and heavier than even a modern lodge. Um, after seizing it up, I gave it away to a friend. Um, so it's, so that's why I don't have it and I don't use it. But, um, yeah, no, no, there's no question about that, uh, Martin for one, their pans were thick and heavy, uh, even more so than BSR. So they, um, and somebody else says there is a business case for the smooth finish. Let me, let's see, let me see what we say here. Um, the rougher. There's a business case for the rougher finish for sure. There's no debating that. That's one of the reasons why I go for the single notch lodge pens. Uh, and somebody else says, uh, I've gotten a great collection of vintage cast iron trivets from the flea market and thrift stores. So that, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing that actually. How many, how many here own an, an eerie cast iron? I have one pancake grill actually. Oops, I may have left this on too long. Let's quickly. Put this over, get this out onto the pan, in fact, or plate. So here comes all number two. Actually, it looks like I can twist it a little bit to flip it. There we go. And by the way, this doesn't seem to be sticking at all, does it? <laughs> so that's why I've, I have no problem at all cooking in a modern day lodge. And that's number two. This one has a little bit more color. And having said that, I think let's bring out number three and see how well that turns out. Change this around a little bit because it looks like we've managed to get some use out of all of these pans so far. Uh, I guess maybe I should apologize to the Kleenex for the way we, I've treated it tonight. <laughs> I think I'm going to make up for it because, as I did mention already, the Finex is the pan that I go to when it comes to making steaks. And did somebody say something about an Erie? Uh, what did it say here? Poll time for Trevor Fillmore. How many here own a piece of Erie cast iron? Only, I only have one, a pancake griddle. Yeah, this one I've actually owned. Oh, my God goodness, has it really been almost 10 years, probably about nine years or so? Yeah, I think it was. Um, in fact, since I've been doing all of these 10 year anniversaries, I'm not going to get into too much detail over this one, but it was about just about this time, 10 years, 10 years ago on a, uh, road trip to uh, visit my friends in New York that I think I went on my very first cast iron antiquing expedition. I mean, after all, you always remember your first time. And it was in the uh, boondocks of, up, of upper middle state New York, you know, or basically around the area of Route 88, the one that goes between uh, Albany and Binghamton and goes through the town of Oneonta and is near um, Cooperstown. There are actually several really good antique uh, places in that area there. And, there, um, and it was there that I managed to score this uh, Erie number eight. So uh, you never know what you're going to find, even in places like uh, upstate New York. Hmm. All right, let's get this out for the last time. 
Then after that, I think we will get down to some steaks so that we have steak and eggs. And if nothing else, even though I haven't been able to do much of an experiment, may be able to consider how to uh, try a thick versus thin test again in the future. Um, since obviously the uh, test of uh, residual heat, unfortunately, did not work out that well. But that's, oh, on the other hand, I did accomplish one other goal. I wanted to use up these eggs because they've been sitting in the fridge for a while. So I'm glad to uh, be rid of these. And then from here, let's do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, let me throw out a poll. Out of these four pans, I have two steaks to cook tonight. Which ones would you like to see? I've got a Finex. I've got the uh, BSR Red Mountain. I've got the Lodge Blacklock, and I have the Erie. Um, yeah, and the uh, Griswold Erie. Out of these four pans, I'd say, what would you folks like to see a steak cooked in? Because that's going to come next after this last omelet here. Which is going in right now. And I have to confess about one other thing. Hmm, it's curious that this isn't, that this almost seems to have a different consistency here. But I do have to confess about one thing. This uh, little eerie here is a spinner, unfortunately. Um, because as I mentioned, I got this thing about 10 years ago. And quite frankly, I was still learning how to cook uh, back in those days. I was really excited about cooking in cast iron. And I made one of the uh, no, one one of the uh, mistakes that well I hope that it's a common mistake that people make when learning to cook in cast iron. I heated the pan up too high on a regular basis. Uh, I would regularly blast these uh, blast the uh, stovetop burner all the way at the maximum high heat when cooking things. And uh, as a result, yes, I did actually have a couple of grease fires because of that. I heated it so hot that some things like bacon grease would just poof into flame as soon as I put it on the on the uh, on the stovetop. Um, I know I did not have any disasters, thank goodness. But uh, that was the, what really gave me the inspiration of how of uh, cooking of that uh, video I did of cooking a steak where I intentionally set my stove top on fire. I'm sure uh, you folks have probably seen that one. <laughs> Nonetheless, wait, look at this. <laughs> there we go. Nonetheless, um, despite that, um, the re repeated blasting of the uh, stove top heat, unfortunately, did indeed turn this lovely vintage Erie into a spinner. I warped it. That was my own fault, and it is something that I've really been trying to make up for by, well, learning to be what I hope is a, a somewhat better cook. Although my cooking skills still leave something to be desired, as you can see here. Regardless, I have not gotten rid of this airy pan, um, largely because I want to keep it as an heirloom. It's nice to bring out on special occasions, you know, it's like, you know, for special moments, then it's time to bring out a special pan. And just as important, even though it's still a spinner, it still cooks, there's no denying that. Now, let's see. Hey, this, this actually looks like it may very well work. So that's not, that wasn't so bad. Let's bring this over a little bit. This side here is definitely not as cooked as the other. We've got hot spots here, which as I said, have a lot to do with my crappy stove. And we'll try a double flip and hey, that actually turned out pretty good. There are some residual eggs, yes, but nonetheless, we have got something going on here. This looks like it's going to be omelet number three. Uh, so even though we're off, we were off to a slow start tonight, 
I can only pro I can only do my best to promise that next week will be a little less hazardous or a little less trying, I guess. What episode was the fire? It was not live. This was um, um about nine years ago, in fact. If you look at my um if you look at my YouTube channel and you look in fact under the listing of popular uploads, um, you'll see that that is currently number three. <laughs> After nine years, it's still the third most popular video on my channel. The number one uh, video on my channel is still, I'm proud to say, my video on identifying vintage uh, unmarked cast iron. Number two, which I'm, <laughs> I'm really more amused than anything else, Number two is now the can opener video. Yeah, the one that I'd spent all of about five minutes on a Saturday morning doing an amusing little video on using a can opener. And that is the one that's, that took off, has over 600,000 views and climbing. <laughs> and number three is the video where it, which I called the dangers or the hazards of cast iron cooking. And as an example of that, I set my stovetop on fire. Anyway, look at this. We've got uh, number, omelet number three. As always, thank you for your patience with all of this, folks. Despite all, despite all of this, I hope my little, uh, I hope my little mishaps here have been uh, amusing. Now we've got ourselves some omelets to get through. However, as I said, we, I have promised already, and I promised Jamie as well. We've got a steak coming. Here is where I asked uh, a little earlier, which of these pans would uh, you folks like to see a steak cooked at? One says uh, Erie, one says Finex, one says BSR, one says BSR or Finex, Erie, BSR, Erie. <laughs> so far, it looks like Erie, I, it looks like the Erie is going to be one of them. I keep seeing Erie, Erie or Finex, uh, BSR. BSR or Finex, <laughs> throw it in the Erie. Uh, Erie is the oldest, go with it. <laughs> so uh, it's starting to see, can we see that uh, Finex in action and under the microscope? Well, um, that wouldn't be a bad plan in itself. So I'd say from the sound of it, I think we're gonna end up doing the uh, Erie and the uh, Finex for our, uh, for our steaks. So we've got the old and the new even though the black block is newer. And we also have the light and the heavy, so it looks like we may very well have a test after all. However, before I do that, I've got to uh, wipe these pans out. Let me do this as quickly as I can here. Yeah, because, you know, well, on the other hand, this is nicely cooked eggs here. We don't want to get rid of this residue here. So just get move this all out and and now having done that it's time to start heating up this one now from here we've got the finex which i'm gonna have to move that thing out Ugh, move, remove, remove the residue on this one as well so give me just a second thank you as always for your patience folks <clears throat> for this one going to be interesting because this residue on here is going to burn and it's almost certainly going to smoke. <laughs> no? Just do what we can and we will get ready for it. Besides, at this point, I think my neighbors are used to my smoke detector. Thank you for your patience, as I've said already. There we go. Turn that up as well. And as best as I can, let's try doing a quick wipe this way before it gets too hot. That's better. Anyway, ugh, yeah. As I said, my bad wrist. Notice how this thing is starting to smoke already. It's not wasting any time, is it? 
Okay. What do we have now? <laughs> Don't use Stumpy. <laughs> well, I haven't made steak in Stumpy yet, actually. <laughs> I changed my vote to whatever is the heaviest and the thickest. That would be the uh, Finex right here. So uh, you're, you are uh, getting your wish here. For some reason, I feel like going to the kitchen and cooking eggs in cast iron. Weird. Well, I'm glad at least, you know, that I didn't embarrass myself too much. Um, as I said, I can only promise next week we'll, I, I will do my best to make next week a lot less hazardous or a lot less uh, glitch-free. <laughs> Papa Dan, I gave them a quick lesson on how to tell a BSR in a three-notch lodge after I bought them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, boy, in fact, this thing here, because this thing is warped, I notice. If you, Actually, let's take a look here. This is the, um, as I mentioned, this is the uh, Erie here. I am heating this thing up to uh, be able to cook a steak. And... Because it has, because it's warped, because it has a, uh, it's a spinner. There's definitely a hot spot in the center, and you can see that because it's unfortunately burning the rest of the oil off around it. So, I'm just gonna have to uh, prepare for that. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna start getting the prepping these steaks for the pan. <laughs> Definitely have to say I'm looking forward to that. All right. While we're doing so, though, I don't want to bore you any more than I have done so already tonight. So we've got... Hello there from Arizona. Hello, Jesse Herrera. You said something last week about posting photos of some cast iron. Where would I do that? Uh, well, you could send it as an email attachment to my email address, motomac.com, or you could go to my Facebook page, which is, again, called Cast Iron Chaos. Just go on to Facebook and look for that name, Cast Iron Chaos, and you will find my page. Third option, of course, would be the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook. Uh, which is um, also, uh, again, that's pretty much what the name of it is, Cast Iron Cooking. <laughs> so, and while we're doing this, it's time to get out the steaks. Oh, yeah. we got a couple of nice ones here, in fact. One is a bone-in strip steak, and one is a semi-boneless ribeye. So this is the part yeah, I've been really looking forward to doing. But I didn't want to start the video with this because, well, really, everything else is going to be something of an anticlimax, so to speak. Of course, on the other hand, it might have been better than what happened when I accidentally uh, cut off the sound and had to cancel the feed. So I will be apologizing probably about 50 more times tonight. <clears throat> we Right now we are busy patting off the steaks, getting uh, some of the uh, excess moisture on them, off of them. Maybe I should actually quickly move some of these things away. And... Time to turn on the fan. I uh, hope that doesn't ruin the sound again. Meanwhile, what we have going now, stick number one, stick number two. <laughs> One of these is thinner than the other. So I'm definitely gonna have to bring out some temperature control here. That's the other thing about, about cooking meat in cast iron. One thing I've really become a convert to, and that is temperature control. I very, very highly recommend the use of a uh, probe thermometer for uh, cooking just about any kind of meat, whether it's chicken or pork or steak. <laughs> quickly that's one that's two let's 
gotta get some pepper on there. Only a little bit, because Jamie's not a heavy pepper person. On the other hand, I am. So, side two, and then we will be ready to go. Well, that's the other thing. Uh, like everything else, when cooking steaks, there's arguments over every step of it. Some say to salt the steak well in advance. Some say to salt it immediately before uh, putting it in the pan. As you can see, I am uh, salting it immediately before putting it in the pan. The steak has been resting and coming to room temperature. But at this point, I am ready to just simply blast these things in cast iron and see what happens. Actually, I hope this is hot enough, especially because of the burner. So I've got one last thing to do, and that is, well, as I mentioned, check the temperature. Oh yeah, this one's definitely hot enough. This one, not so much. I'm gonna have to definitely have to turn up the heat on this one. So, oh, well, that's getting a little better now. All right, that means, without further ado, let's cook. Oops, actually, I've got one last thing. Really, my bad. Now we are ready. And even though this is a thin pan, this thing got really hot really fast, largely because of the uh, much more efficient burner on the front than the back. So I've definitely got to keep an eye on these. You know, after all, we don't want them to overcook. Nonetheless, boy, that should get some YouTube hits. <laughs> You know, it's almost as though cooking steak in cast iron guarantees you hits on YouTube. I'd say in some ways it probably does. <laughs> okay, what else do we have here? Um, win, uh, windle, wind spoons. Uh, I, I made a steak in my cast iron a couple of years ago. I haven't had a steak in a while. <laughs> uh, Indian pie, don't... Uh, okay, yeah, that's all right. Um... Cast iron chaos without a little chaos. Yeah, I know, I know. I it's just that I I do feel upset when these little things happen because they shouldn't happen. I mean, this one in particular was my fault. Oh well. Um, okay, let's keep doing this now. For Miss French twist, saving that. You might need higher heat on the thinner skillet because it is losing heat quickly. Well, there is that, of course. Okay, and at this point, I need to... There they are. Try to break out the tongs and do the first flip. I am definitely a fan of the constant flip method of uh, cooking a steak here, which means you you flip the steak maybe every minute or so. Um, I have not had a problem with that. I think that uh, heating both sides in that manner builds up better crust than simply letting it sit on one side, flipping it, and then uh, and then just uh, let it sit until done. I have done the reverse sear method a couple of times, and, and, and yeah, I have to say that is a really nice method for making a steak as well. I guess uh, the only... My... Dis, my uh, complaint about the reverse sear is that it requires a lot more preparation because you know you got to cook it in the oven before you can uh, actually uh, you know just sear it on the stove top yes you do have good temperature control though and that's my concern I'm really doing my best to keep an eye on this especially since this steak is much thinner than this one so I will definitely be keeping an eye on this one for Jamie. 
In fact, I have little doubt this is going to end up coming out of the pan a lot faster than this one will. Not, not even just because of the uh, higher temperature. But anyway, that's really the thing. I mean, if, if somebody like me can cook a good steak, and I like to think I can, then really, as they say, anybody can do it. Um, one person, and I don't mention names, uh, says that they, they are having trouble mastering a steak. Well, the answer to that is don't try to master it. Just make your, just get, have fun and cook yourself a steak. And it's certain to come out the way you want it to come out. So speaking of temperature control here. The steak is uh, just over 100 degrees. This one, on the other hand, which is much thicker, is only at about uh, still less than 90. So this is definitely going to take longer to cook than this one. No question about that. And flip. Now it's starting to get somewhere. Hmm. idea how when I actually don't have a donation uh, button on my uh, on my uh, live chat here. Um, if it went to another charity or something, I'm more than happy about that. <laughs> that was John uh, Glade. Since I'm not getting your live stream notifications, that live stream glitch post is the reason why I finally made it to a live stream. You know? Well, I'm glad you showed up. That's, that's really the best I can say, and I can say that about anybody. I think this steak is almost done already. So, oh yeah, you too. Let's give this one another check. And we find we are at 127 already. Okay, time for this one to come out of the pan. I'm not going to waste any time here. There we are, there's one, and that did not take long at all, did it? Now, I get to put the Erie aside, and cool, and bring the, bring the Kleenex over onto the heat, the better heat. So from here, while we are at it, Get a little unhealthy butter in here. Jamie, are you there? Well, when you feel like it, come and grab your steak. What was that? Okay. Okay. There we go. Just a little bit of butter. And we keep flipping it to get ourselves Oh man, this is really starting to look good now. <laughs> uh, you can have a super chat on mobile by selecting the dollar sign, and that has a donation option. Okay, I honestly don't know where the money goes, but I'll, I'll look into that a little later. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for that. BSR Red Mountain cooks steak very well and quick. Yes, it does. I have actually cooked uh, a number of steaks in that Red Mountain pan, along with everything else, and I've had uh, no complaints at all about that. Now, before I talk too much, let's still keep an eye on the steak, shall we? Now, this is much thicker, so it still only says about 100, uh, 109, oh, 117. We are getting close, maybe about another minute or so. Yeah, oh yeah, this ends here. Okay, 
I will just maybe give it another flip and then it will probably be done. Mm. Especially since it's going to, uh, the temperature is going to rise as it rests in the pan. So let's not take any chances, shall we? Because after all, we got ourselves a steak here. Mm -hmm. And voila. Thanks to everybody who stuck around because at least you got to see a couple of steaks cooked in cast iron. Few things in this world are better than that. Let's turn the heat off at last. Yeah, there's a lot of smoke in here. Yet somehow I managed to do this without the smoke alarm going off. Well, don't say anything yet because there's still smoke in here. <laughs> okay, so anyway, if nothing else, I've wasted everybody's time here talking about, as I mentioned, the difference between thin cast iron and, and thick cast iron. And like a several other topics, I can only say this is to be continued only because yet again, because of the way I kind of messed things up tonight, I want to do, a, I'm going to uh, plan this out a little better next time. I mean, I was kind of, I was, well, number one, I did not expect the feed to go out. I was kind of hoping that uh, cooking, as I said, in the residual heat would have had better results. But, you know, better this way, because now we've got some steak and omelets to go with it, too. So, uh, cornbread in cast iron ranks right up there with steak. Oh, yeah. I actually used this Finex to uh, make a 12-inch uh, cornbread, technically like a 10-inch cornbread. And, uh, man, did that turn out good. That was actually more of a cornbread cake because it was so large. Here's one thing about the Finex, by the way. I mean, it says it's a number 12, and it says it's 12 inches. That's 12 inches between the uh, wide uh, corners there. It's not a full 12 inches in diameter. It's actually more like maybe 11 or so. Um, so it's actually smaller than you might get with a uh, number 10 size 12 inch uh, Lodge or Wagner or Griswold or the like. But uh, I still uh, have no complaints about that. I mean, as I said, I've had this uh, pan here since 2014, and it is still my go-to pan for steaks. And I'd say that's the result. So, um, okay, I guess I'll repeat what's been said before about Fine X and those other um, USA-made cast iron pans. But they're so expensive. There's no denying that. I mean, this 12-inch Fine X here would cost you what? somewhere between 160 and 200 dollars really depending on where you get it and is it worth it compared to a uh, 15 dollar lodge 10 inch skillet from Walmart or even a 20 dollar lodge 12 inch skillet from Walmart and the answer to that is maybe um, as I mentioned already, this is my go-to pan really for searing steaks, but really the difference between this, this Finex here and a modern day lodge pan is really like the difference between an outstanding pan and an excellent pan. So, I mean, I mean, this thing here is designed to be like, well, you know, like a Cadillac or a Porsche, whereas the uh, modern day lodge is a, um, you know, is uh, something reliable like you would get. Like maybe, I won't even say a, a Ford Escort, but more like, you know, like a good, decent truck. Because, you know, cast iron pans are tough, like trucks. And they will do the job for you, and, and you'll have no complaints at all with a uh, lodge pan. A Finex pan, of course, is something that you can show off and brag to people with or about. <laughs> uh, I really like my Finex pan, Bookworm 73, but I like my vintage better. <laughs> uh, peg 2, look at all those juices. I add some very bl strong black tea to deglaze it. Awesome on mashed potatoes. Oh, yeah, I have no intention of wasting these either, so... And, uh, um, yeah, actually, Bookworm73, here's the thing. Um, you know, Kenji Lopez-Alt, the famous guy who uh, did who does Serious Eats, and he's got a YouTube channel, too, where he does casual videos. Um, kind of like this, in fact. A lot of them he does it while wearing a head cam. 
There was one video I saw just today that he made about a year ago where he went through all of the pans in his kitchen and uh, and just decided which ones to keep and which ones to give away or donate. He went through a large pile of cast iron and uh, he had a nice collection of both vintage and uh, modern day cast irons. And he decided to get rid of almost all of the modern day cast iron. He got rid of uh, a Finex, a Butter Pat, a Field, um, a Marquette, uh, all of which he had used. But as he said, it, uh, he his short answer was he preferred his vintage pans because he had quite a few Wagner and Griswold in there and a couple of Lodge as well. His, he said his most used cast iron pan was a modern day Lodge chicken fryer, you know, with a uh, skillet lid. Uh, Stargazer looks nice. Yes, indeed. I've uh, been reseasoning the Stargazer, and I'm going to be bringing that one out again as well. So, hmm. okay. Um, having done all that, I mean, you know, we are r r pretty much approaching the usual time, it seems like, where these things are ending here. Uh, you know, because this is actually the second feed for this evening. This steak has been resting very well as well. So I think I'd better do one last thing, you know, which of course is a requirement when you uh, want to do a video of cooking a steak in cast iron. And that would be the reveal. So let's bring this over. And here we are, steak knife. This is a memento of my New York trip, which I will never forget. Okay, let's, well, might as well go distance here, see what, how well this thick steak cooked. And I'd say from the looks of it, we are definitely in the medium rare range. I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, well, I only I only cut mine. I did not cut yours. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I have your permission to cut yours open. All right. Let's see how well it turned out. If I overcooked it, you can have mine. Well, I did make sure to uh, take it out of the pan early, so here's hoping that uh, Jamie's. Let's see what Jamie's steak looked like. And cutting against, hit, cutting against the grain. Well, here's the result. I would say this is unfortunate. Well, no, there is still some medium in there, but unfortunately, because it's a thinner steak, I have to say, yeah, we're probably closer to a medium than uh, than rare, unfortunately. As I said, you can have mine. No, that's not all right. Okay. All right, but anyway, nonetheless, there we go. Yeah, part of this actually turned out pretty good. Uh, I guess I can. All I can say is going to have to practice uh, thicker. You know, practice cooking thinner steaks. Like maybe tomorrow, for instance, when I'm going to uh, prepare a video of uh, doing cube steak. And somebody, uh, Miss French Twist says Jamie's looks better. <laughs> Having said all of that, well, yet again, I mean, I guess I'm at the point now where I am getting pretty tired because, you know, it is something, it is a work night still. And why is this thing not, uh, okay, now what's going on? Oh, I'm twisting this the wrong way. <laughs> My bad. Oh, finally. Nonetheless, I mean, as much as I was hoping this would have been a better uh, demonstration tonight, I am only going to say once again that this is to be continued because I do want to get a better look here at the differences between thinner and thicker cast iron. And nonetheless, all we can do is, well, just keep on cooking, everybody. Thank you, as always, everyone, for showing up. So, you know, Dano, Ozark, and Peg Tooth, and Raymond, and Bookworm, 73 and Papa Dan cooked my cornbread last night in a BSR number five and eight leftovers tonight. Hmm. Here's hoping that uh, you have some nice steak to go with it. Thank you again for watching, everyone. We will uh, just uh, call this a to be continued, and I will 
See you all next Wednesday.